Okay, so hi everybody. This is the next chapter of our Physician Perspective Series hosted by MedMentors at UCLA. The, the goal of this series is essentially for us to talk to physicians from a specific specialty and kind of get their experiences and journey through medicine, starting as pre-medical students and then all the way to being residents and attending physicians. So the first thing I'd like to do is go ahead and give a little introduction for all of our speakers. So no more technical difficulties. I have this part down at least. Uh, okay, I spoke too soon. Okay, uh, and then presenting from the beginning. So this is our talk series. My name is Emmanuel. I am a fourth year medical student at DGSM at UCLA. So I'm gonna go through our speakers. So we have Dr. Naveen Alfara. She obtained her MD from Chicago Medical School and she completed all of her training from internship residency to being a chief resident at UCLA Medical Center. And she's currently a professor of clinical medicine um, at the Division of General Internal Medicine associated uh, um, with the David Geffen School of Medicine. And she's also received many distinguished teaching awards. Um, we're very happy to have her join us today. And then our other speakers would be Dr. Patrick Holman. So Dr. Patrick Holman's from Austin, Texas, and also San Diego. He went to UCSD. UCSD, I actually went there for my undergraduate and master's as well. Uh, he also attended a uh, medical school in Chicago before returning to Southern California for uh, the completion of a combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency program at UCLA. Um, he's also participated in medical education, completing a medical education fellowship and in various clinical research uh, projects and also working with the LGBT community. We have Dr. Rachel Ullman as well. Dr. Rachel Ullman, another University uh, of Chicago uh, student and physician. Um, she has also had a background in, in biology and minors in history, philosophy, and social studies. Uh, she's done translational research uh, through the NIH, through the post uh intramural research training program before returning to California to complete medical school and residency. And she ultimately hopes to go into cardiology. Then we have Dr. George Tran also with us today. Dr. George Tran is a California native, just like myself. Um, he went to UC Irvine before going to the East Coast for Duke University. And now he's back here completing an internal med medicine residency at UCLA. So now that we're a little more familiar with our speakers, I kind of want to go ahead and get started with the heart of our conversation here. So the general kind of format is that I'll ask questions. And then you guys can feel free to answer the question or jump on. I'll give time for everybody to kind of give their insight. Uh, don't feel like you need to answer every question. You can sometimes just defer to the next one. So with that, um, let's get started. So something that a lot of our uh, medical or pre-medical student attendees are, are interested in and questions about is medical volunteering. Um, so the first question I have for the panel is, were there any medical volunteering opportunities, whether that be volunteering in a hospital or being an EMT or a scribe that you found very rewarding? And did any of these opportunities lead for a chance for you to do physician shadowing? I'll break the ice for us. Okay. Um, what I will say is, so I, I volunteered back when I was in college at UC Irvine. Um, there's a local Kaiser hospital uh, down in Sand Canyon, which is like also in Irvine. And so I volunteered there in the emergency department for a couple of years, I think starting like my second year of college, um, all the way through. And then I took a gap year to apply to med school. So I was there for like three or four years. Um, it, was a, it was a good experience. I would say the clinical volume is a lot lower than compared to a place like UCLA, for example. Um, but it was a good opportunity to just see how that medicine is a team sport. Um, I didn't get to necessarily shadow physicians per se that I had to like seek out in my local community. But overall, I think like any sort of shadowing or volunteer experience is good. Um, yeah, I would, I would uh, echo uh, George's point that um, I don't think anyone needs to feel stressed about having to have a certain type of volunteering uh, activity or background or a certain number of hours um, that that ultimately having some exposure can be helpful, but that it doesn't have to be a certain kind or a certain amount. Um, because I think all of us have had varying levels of exposure. And for me personally, my first volunteering opportunity um, 
that I participated in was also around the same time, I think second year in college. But for me, it was very impactful because I had not yet decided on medicine, actually. I was pretty sure that I wanted to get a PhD and go into research and, and not go the medical route. And so for me, it was eye-opening in terms of piquing my interest in working with patients and not just cells in the lab, and then to actually help kind of direct my further investigations. And then during my time at the NIH, in addition to doing research, I did some volunteering in a local clinic as well, um, which, which was helpful. But I think it's one piece of the bigger, the bigger process and journey. Dr. Holman, do you want to go or I can go next, whatever you would like? Um, sure. Yeah, I think I, I similarly did volunteering at UCSD for, I think also started in second year in college and there's a, a trend here. Um, you know, I, I thought it was kind of a mixed experience. Like you get to see how things are in the hospital, which is nice. I float around a couple of different units, but I, you don't really get much, at least I didn't get much patient interaction. I didn't really get much interaction with the physicians themselves. And I found a lot more connections through research and through some other like extracurriculars to actually meet clinicians and start shadowing. And so I think it kind of just depends on the, the experience itself. I think uh, when you're thinking about medicine, you definitely want to get exposure into kind of a multiple areas. And so shadowing in a hospital is one way in. And I think med students or med school um, committees do like to see that you've like put in time to learn what medicine is and you have a realistic expectation of what that is as a career. And so I think this is one opportunity to do that. Um, but I don't know if it was like monumental or groundbreaking for me at least. Yes, all, all um, interesting insight. So um, for me, I was actually exposed to medicine at a very young age because um, I have severe asthma. I still have severe asthma, but it's very well controlled now. Um, but as a child, I was in and out of the hospital quite a bit. And so um, that exposure was so, I mean, I think really helped develop my career path in terms of what I wanted to do. Um, I was a candy striper when I was, and that's what we were called back then. It wasn't one of the volunteers um, at Howard Presbyterian um, Medical Center when I was in high school, actually, because I was so focused um, and set on going into medicine. And when I graduated college, I ended up working, um, doing, taking a year off, or a couple of years off, actually, and doing um, some research. And I was working with a hepatologist and through the work that I was doing research-wise, I got exposed to clinical hepatology, which I know well until this day, probably because of that experience that, I've, that I had with him because it was so immersive. Um, and so I, I had the opportunity to work with patients and to see patients and learn, start learning some of the medical um, lingo. So I, I think it's a, it's a great experience. It's not, I think, an essential piece in regards to your application to medical school. I think you have to understand the career that you're going into um, and the selflessness of what it means, I think, to be a doctor um, because your patients and your and their their families really come first as you uh, practice medicine as a career. And so I think it's something that um, you know we are all or I'm, I will talk about work life balance, but still struggling to find that work life balance. But I I know that. I have to take care of myself um, in order to be able to take care of patients and their families. But when I'm on clinical service, they are um, of utmost priority um, in terms of how I prioritize my days. I think, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think what I'm kind of garnering from you guys' responses is that the medical volunteering experiences are important, but it's also important to be a holistic and, and well-rounded person and to explore other options before you decide medicine's for you. So I guess uh, the next question I wanted to kind of address and talk about was outside of like medical volunteering and outside of physician shadowing as a pre-medical student, were there any volunteer services in the community or experiences you had that weren't directly medicine, but you found that you developed some kind of skill or experience that benefited you as a medical student or resident? So anything, it can, it can be related to medicine, but something maybe like a community service or some kind of a service trip or something outside of medicine that you feel like you you did in college that that had some kind of an impact on on who you were as a medical student and a physician. Uh, one of the things that I was really passionate about was I volunteered as a camp counselor for an organization called Camp Ronald McDonald for Good Times, 
It's for uh, it's a camp for children with cancer and their siblings. Um, and that was something that was just, it was a different focus than sort of the other pre-med things I was working on. And one of the ways it's impacted my career as a physician is it's reminded me of not just the effect that an illness has on a patient, but also their loved ones and sort of all the other factors that go into um, taking care of someone with especially chronic illness. Uh, so that's something that's really near and dear to my heart and that I still do to this day. That's awesome. I did something very similar with Camp Kesem, which is the same premise, but I, I second that. Um, I think the other thing that I did was I spent a few months in Uganda as part of kind of a global health trip um, that really kind of swayed me from engineering to actually go into medicine. And so I think just that for me was a much more formative experience than my like hospital volunteering here actually going and seeing kind of medicine and what it's like in a different country and how you know, we can help in those kinds of situations. I, I thought it was a really uh, transformative experience for me. Um, I would say my my answer is a little bit different. Um, I didn't do as much of the other clinical volunteering until some of my time at the NIH when I was mentioning the underserved clinic um, at which I worked and I had volunteered with another program as well. But while in college, um, something totally separate from medicine or, or care of patients. I ran cross country and track at the University of Chicago all four years. And um, I just mentioned that because it's an example of another passion of mine that was remarkably formative in my growth as a young person, but also as my development into being the kind of teammate that I try to be in the hospital. And so I think my resilience that I developed in athletics and my understanding of what constitutes a teammate and what constitutes the kind of selflessness that Dr. Alfaro was talking about. Really, those, those understandings come from that foundational time in athletics. And so I mentioned that um, because if there's anyone else who feels like, oh, well, I, I have this passion in music or in art or in athletics or some other community space where you're learning some of those principles, um, those you can carry with you and really do make you a better medical student, resident, and physician, ultimately. Completely agree. Um, I, I, I did a lot of medicine. <laughs> I can't think of like other things that I did that were not related to medicine. So I will pass on this question. <laughs> but you got three amazing answers. I will say one more thing that kind of has come up a lot. I, I worked in a restaurant for like, during high school and all through college. And I think just customer service jobs in general are so translatable mm -hmm. to medicine. Um, you learn a lot of just how to interact with people, your interpersonal skills, how to deal with people who are unhappy, which is sometimes you deal with in medicine as well. And then I think teamwork is such a huge part, especially in the restaurant environment when you're like running between tables and triaging and even when I was in here for residency, I had several program directors tell me they look for people with restaurant experience because the skills are so translatable. And so I think that, you know, customer mm -hmm. service in general is a really good um, place to develop some of those skills and can help you be successful when you start your career as a physician. My, um, my current, so I, I'm interested in, in the specialty of PM&R and my current uh, mentor for PM&R actually ran a restaurant before he became a physician. So I would definitely, it's, it's interesting that I'm hearing that again, but I've definitely heard that like the, the service industry, there's, there's a lot of parallels to be had there, and especially with managing people. And I think, you know, the themes that I'm getting too, so being a counselor and then being on a team is being able to work in conjunction with people at a high level to achieve a goal. So one thing I wanted to ask too, a question that has come up a couple of times is, um, as physicians, I'd say that we are in large part partially, well, I'm not there yet, but partially, you know, we're leaders of the team. So how do, or have you had experiences in leadership as either a pre-medical student or medical student? And how do you go about entering or finding leadership roles? One of the things that Rach mentioned um, that I wanted to echo is that I think there's a lot of stock placed into like leadership positions and like roles of mentorship and leadership. But I do also want to take the time to acknowledge the people who are more of like team players and take more of a supporting role. I think that doesn't get acknowledged enough in medicine, which is primarily a team sport. Um, 
so for me, for example, this is a very long-winded answer, but you know, I, I didn't have very many leadership. Please things. go for it. Please go for it. <laughs> I didn't have very many leadership involvement things in like college or med school. Um, I, I was involved in a PAMSA, which is the Asian Pacific American uh, Medical Student Association in med school. And like eventually worked my way up to being president because I was really passionate about it. But otherwise, you know, me personally didn't, you know, I didn't really seek out very many other leadership opportunities, more so because I felt like I had interests and skills in, in serving more of like as a team member as opposed to a leader. I mean, that you can lead in different ways. It's just something I want to verbalize and acknowledge. I love that, George. And I completely agree. I think there are so many ways in which we can contribute and lead and to only envision leadership as being this big, flashy, loud, shiny role in certain spaces, we end up missing out on other ways in which people are contributing and being leaders. And I think that translates nicely to the point I was going to make returning to um, this idea of the areas in which you already have passions um, and interests are areas rich with opportunity to find some elements of leadership. Um, however, those opportunities may look. And so for me personally, that was within the space of athletics um, at the University of Chicago and being on a Women's Athletic Association. It was in the space of creating science programming for women interested in science at the University of Chicago. But those were already two areas of such passion and interest. I wasn't looking to add something to my list of activities to check off a box. It was growing an opportunity within a pre-existing passion. And I think when you're growing something organically within a pre-existing passion, it can, you open yourself to different leadership roles. Maybe you're not the president, but you are the person making new programming for high schoolers interested in science, or you're taking the treasurer role, or there are so many different roles and opportunities, especially if you're already invested in that space. Yeah, I think I completely agree. I think in undergrad, I didn't have a ton of like big flashy roles, but I definitely contribute to a lot of projects and, 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 and things. And I think as long as you can speak, you know, intelligently about what you've done and what you're passionate about, all those things come through and you can demonstrate leadership by the things you've done, not necessarily the roles that you have or that's on the resume. I think in med school, I got some more formalized leadership um, where I got involved in like student leader, student government and things like that, which were a fun way to kind of uh, help um, help advocate for my my peers and and help improve the med school experience for us. So I definitely got it a little bit later on um, in my career, or yes, in, in med school rather than undergrad, at least. Um, but I think there is a lot you can learn in stepping into some of those kind of more public roles. And so I think. Um, there's value in kind of having different types of leadership like the panel has discussed so far. Yes, agree um, with everything that's been said, been said and I can't emphasize Patrick's comment about um, looking for students who've been involved in, um, you know, service. So like working at a restaurant or working in sales or um, where you really have to deal with all different types of um, people and issues that come up. And, and again, it builds resilience. And then also very much with, with um, Dr. Oman's comment about the athleticism and that teamwork. Um, it's when, when you see that people are on have been involved in sports um, and it, it, it's just a different mindset um, sometimes that they come with that is built on resilience, that is built on this mentality of how can I be better? And so those are actually incredible um, character traits to have. Um, I never was involved in student government in med school. Um, I did, um, I was a counselor, um, elected as a counselor, uh, so for peers by my class. Um, and that um, obviously very much spoke to me because I'm, I always have this desire to do what I can to help people. Um, whether it's patients or or colleagues um, or students and residents. But I, um, and so it, that role was very interesting to me because um, of the trust that you had to build amongst colleagues um, that you are sitting next to each other in a class. And, you know, if, um, I, I mean, there was a, a pretty serious incident that happened um, where one of my um, co-students was in a, a pretty bad 
um, bar fight and then just incredibly bruised and I wasn't there for it, but they called me and said, could you like check in on him and um, perhaps drive him to class the next day, et cetera. And so I, you know, of course I said, of course, and, and, you know, I, I could clearly tell that he didn't want to talk about it. I'm very respectful of that. Um, but just making him aware that, you know, I'm there for him if he does want to talk. And obviously a lot of that's translatable into the work that we do in, in medicine every day. So. Thank you for sharing that. I think that must be incredibly difficult to have a, a fellow classmate or fellow person you're working with go through that and to support them through that. So um, the picture I'm getting, what I'm understanding is that, you know, the definition of leadership and what it means to be a leader doesn't necessarily just mean the person who is the flashiest or the person who's in the spotlight, but that leadership can involve being a really good team member and team player. And so I think the next question I have too is that if you wanted to convey aspects of your personality or your skills or your perspectives to a potential letter writer as a pre-medical student or medical student, what would be the best way to give information to a letter writer and to request a letter of recommendation either for medical school or for residency? I can go first on that because <laughs> I've had years of experience of it. The way that I think of letter writers is for buckets. Okay, um, there's bucket A where you have, it's kind of like a, a two by two table um, and there's an A, B, A, B. And so you have bucket A, someone who knows you well and someone who has um, also has like a, a prestigious title. So is, is an, a program director or some, you know, a professor or some role. Um, the next slot is someone who doesn't know you as well but um, but they have that title. The, then there's someone who knows you well, they don't have that title. And then there's someone who doesn't know you well and doesn't have the title. So that, that one is out. It's always much um, in, in your best interest to go to someone who knows you well, because you don't have to convey those character traits to them. They've seen it in the work that you do in the lab via research or the work that you do seeing patients on the wards or the work that you do with community service, if you're involved in a community service project, or the work that you do as you come and talk to them about some of the global health work that you're doing. And so it's it's much better to get a letter writer where those character traits don't have to be conveyed um, in, a, in a way so that you're, you're almost kind of um, prompting them in terms of what to, to write about you. Um, most letter, most people who are writing letters of recommendation are very well, you know, experienced. I mean, even junior attendings um, come to me and ask me for like a sample letter so they could see what it looks like. Um, but I always advise students don't ask ask um, letters from people who you've worked with and that know you because those are going to be the best um, to and to convey who you are as a person. I completely agree, Dr. Alfaro. Could not have said it better. Not surprising coming with you from you with your experience. Um, Thank you. And I would just add to that if anyone's wondering, well, if I only work with this person in this one space, and maybe there's some time limitation, or I'm not with them all the time, how will they know all of these things about me? What Dr. Alfaro was referencing, and I just wanted to briefly touch on this idea of making sure that you water your relationships with your mentors. Remember, these are two-way relationships. And so a mentor should be investing in you and watering the relationship from, from the perspective of pouring energy and investment in you. But we as mentees must return and water our relationship with our mentors. And so there are different ways to do that, but a really critical one or just the overarching one is to be in touch with your mentor. And so I actually got some great advice from one of our beloved former CARDS fellows who's now just finished up at Cedars and is now going to be faculty at UCSD, Hillary Shapiro, this idea of even after you finish a research project with someone or you shadowed with someone or you're not seeing them as regularly, regularly checking in with them. So whether that's scheduling regular meetings with your mentors, um, when you're in college, that's what I did with my two most prominent mentors. Um, with whom I worked in college. And I still do that. Whenever I'm back in Chicago um, visiting my husband's family, I schedule meetings with Dr. Mackinnon and Dr. Prince to 
catch up with them and, and, and let them know what I've been doing. Um, but even if you can't meet with them in person, sending an email too. You can send a brief email, you know, a couple times a year to say, hey, this is what I've been up to. Um, would love to set up a time to, to meet, but these are some of the things that, that I've been working on um, and just continuing to make that investment um, from our end as well. I have nothing else to add, Dave. Fantastic job, but yeah, <laughs> couldn't have said it better. I think both of those responses were excellent. And I think I'll take that to heart for myself as well too. I'm currently in the process of applying for residency. So definitely gonna try to water those relationships as you mentioned. Yeah, um, I will say um, just to add one other thing, a lot of letter writers do ask for your CV and your personal statement. So it's good to have, um, some sort of timeline in your mind of when you're going to be able to send that information to them so they know. And there's a lot that they get out of reading your personal statement about who you are. Because again, as you think about a personal statement, it, it is what it is. It's a personal statement. It's supposed to be about you and speak to what do I want this committee to know about me? What are the character traits that I want them to know? What, what, what built my resiliency when I was in collegiate athletics? or when I was working in a restaurant, you know, those are the things that I think um, are character traits that are incredibly important and carry you through, um, not just medicine, but, but life. I could not have said it better, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, so the next topic I kind of wanted to transition to, so after the whole pre-medical part is once you enter medical school, and you were able to be kind of seeing all the different specialties available. What specialties did you consider when you first started medical school? And did that change as you had your experiences in medical school? I'm happy to go first again. <laughs> So because of my history with asthma, um, I was 100% set on internal medicine and then a fellowship in pulmonary critical care. Um, and I had a mentor um, talking about watering relationships with mentor for years, um, who was a pulmonologist and who said, you can go to med school. And then when you're done, you come back and you'll be my partner. And it was in, he was in the community um, in Pasadena, which is where I went to high school. And so that was my plan. Um, when I was in med school, I am a nerd at heart. I love knowing things. And so um, every rotation and clerkship that I did, look at me, I'm still like thinking back to it now and getting excited about it, how many years later. Um, and it, as it was exciting and so much to learn, I definitely quickly said to myself, I don't wanna be in the OR. Um, I wanna be on the floors with patients and families. Maternal fetal medicine, which is um, high risk OB. Um, so um, usually that deals with um, women who have medical problems that um, could have high risk at the time of delivery or throughout their pregnancy um, was very fascinating to me. And the other specialty was um, emergency medicine. And to the point where in my fourth year, I did a rotation in emergency medicine at LA County USC, which was very intense because you were on your feet for 13 hours a day because the patients are just always there, but so incredibly rewarding, had amazing teachers. And then um, also at Cook County in Chicago because it's where I went to med school. And then again, like remarkable in regards to the teaching I got. But I soon realized that I am a very detailed person and want to follow up and want to know you know, why you, we have certain abnormalities. And I, and I soon came to realize that the ER wasn't the place for me. And I went back to medicine. I even had um, my residents on my medicine rotation tell me that they're going to kill you <laughs> in the ER if you write notes like this. I'm, I'm, I have brought long notes. Um, and so it was just something that was, you know, I, I would laugh with them about it. I was, I never took offense to it, but it was, I, I soon realized like what my personality um, was made for. And I, so yes, I definitely, I thought 100% this is what I'm doing, but then there were other specialties when I was in medicine that were very intriguing to me. Um, but then I went back to, to my original thought. I think 
going into medical school, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, I think partly just because, like I mentioned, Cap Kesem, and I've done a lot of things working with children, and I still am a giant child, <laughs> as some of my colleagues can attest. Um, and so I kind of went through clerkships and I ended up liking most of my rotations. Uh, I, I did this, um, I thought I was going to go into surgery for a long period of time as a pediatric surgery. And then towards the end of my third year, I kind of had a change of heart and said I, I could be happy at being outside of the OR and uh, liked having a little bit more of the, the medicine side. Um, and so I ended up doing um, a double residency where I like taking care of adults and children. And so you can do a, a, a combined residency or um, both internal medicine and pediatrics. And so I thought that was a really fun way to see both kind of the full age spectrum, we say from cradle to grave and see kind of how the diseases transition throughout people's life. And um, I think the perspective of taking care of one helps me think about the other in a different way. Um, ultimately, I'm choosing to take care of primarily adults with fellowship. I'm doing a pulmonary and critical care fellowship like Dr. Alfara had mentioned. Um, so I think your interests can change over time. And so I think it's always good just to kind of keep your mind open and, and see kind of how, your clinic, how you react to the different clinical experiences you're going to go into throughout medical school and residency and, and see what feels the most fulfilling and most, most rewarding to you. I would say for me, I, I pretty quickly on during med school realized that surgery probably wasn't for me. I was definitely interested when I came in, but after having some clinical experiences in it, it just wasn't something that I found fulfillment in. Um, similar to Patrick, I was on the med peds train for like right up until applying for residency. And then, um, you know, I just did some soul searching and decided to just focus on adult medicine. And uh, even during residency, I've had, you know, experiences where I've shifted from one specialty to another before ultimately deciding on a path. And so I think ultimately you may end up on a, you know, taking a different turn than where you anticipated and that's okay. No, I completely agree. And I would just add briefly that I think it's so interesting in medical school because you will meet medical school and residency, but in medical school, you meet some classmates who just knew that they were going to be uh, orthopedic surgeon out, you know, out of the womb and, and arrived to medical school and still felt that way, maybe didn't flirt with other specialties like Dr. Alfaro was sharing with us. Um, and so there were definitely times when I found myself questioning, like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I figure out what I want to do? I similarly ended up interested in so many things and was thinking about surgery and neurology and medicine and med peds. It was ob just all over the place. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the themes that we're discussing of having an open mind, even if you think you know what you want to do, um, being inquisitive and curious in all of the opportunities in medical school, even if you don't go into a field, it's so helpful that I know what it looks like to a liver transplant. I have that seared into my mind from being in the liver ICU and helping to retract and help out during liver transplants, you know, and to have that seared in my mind, even though I'm not a surgeon, has been so helpful in my practice. And then um, Dr. Stark, our anatomy, uh, one of our anatomy professors at UCLA gave me the really great advice that if you're not someone who is going to know clearly that it's definitely this field and not others, if you're not someone for whom an epiphany will fall from the sky, that's okay. You have to pay attention to the more subtle clues. And I think that's when my soul searching became more fruitful. When I started noticing on urology rotations, I kept wanting to bring my stethoscope stethoscope. And then people made fun of me, like, why are you bringing your stethoscope? You don't need to listen to their heart. And I felt like, but I still need to listen, you know, or I was just so curious about the pathophysiology of everything. And so whether you have an epiphany or whether you have to listen to the subtle changes and subtle clues, eventually, I think if you do that soul searching, you'll get there. No, I think that, that oh, please go ahead. I was just going to add quickly that I think this is a kind of a stressful thing in medical school because you have like four to eight weeks in a lot of these specialties and it's hard to figure out like what a career and that really looks like in such a short amount of time. And I think one thing that um, was conveyed to me and I tried to, to convey to others is that there are probably multiple specialties that all of us could have picked and had like very happy, successful careers. And so ultimately it's kind of guessing what your optimal happiness will be, which is a little bit of an impossible task. But I think like Dr. Oman has mentioned, like looking for those things that make you feel most happy and, and bring you the most fulfillment and 
kind of which specialty can kind of help you maintain those kind of on a daily and regular basis that you do have, you don't deal with kind of, um, you, you stay fulfilled for you know, the duration of your career. And kind of, kind of building off of that. So um, now transitioning from medical school to you've chosen your chosen residency as internal medicine. And uh, this, this talk specifically will highlight or highlights internal medicine. So what, what aspects of internal medicine or, or med peds do you find the most rewarding? And then kind of subsequently building off of that, what aspects of internal medicine or med peds are the most challenging? So I would say one of, for me, as someone interested in palliative care, sort of chronic illness, end of life medicine, one of the things I find very rewarding with internal medicine is that you get to interface with patients who are going through all types of different illnesses, whether problems with their heart, their lungs, their kidneys, et cetera, all along the spectrum of illness. And I think that's one of the things I enjoyed most about internal medicine is just the breadth of things that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I find it rewarding to be able to walk with people on that journey, um, whether it's through a, a short-term hospitalization or as their primary care doctor through, a, you know, the long course of time that you're someone's PCP. Um, those are also, for me, some of the most challenging moments, uh, reconciling that, you know, sometimes medicine doesn't have the answer. And unfortunately, there are things that you have to concede in terms of, you know, everybody's life is limited in a particular way. Um, but I do find that rewarding in a sense to at least be able to accompany people on that journey. It's very similar um, to what I was going to share too, George. I think it's so, it, it's really internal medicine is so treasured. Obviously we're all very biased, but I think the reality that you, it's such an intellectually stimulating field. It can even be a tangibly stimulating field if you choose a specialty that's more hands-on. But at the end of the day, because we are responsible for knowing about the whole patient, all the organ systems and how they interact, but more than organ systems, the patient, as George was sharing, and that patient and their sociocultural context and their determinants of health and their life story and their family, um, I think that so many other fields are able to delve into really wonderful areas of, of a patient's experience and their journey through illness, but in internal medicine, being able, being challenged to really hold all together, everything that's happening at once on the level of the pathophysiology up to the whole person um, is the best and the most challenging part. And I think in internal medicine, with it being so focused on inpatient training, um, certainly you can end up spending your entire career on the outpatient side if you'd like, but I think from a training perspective, it means that we get to see people when they are so sick, um, like George was saying, when they're in the inpatient side, when they're admitted to the ICU or the CCU, as well as the wards. And it means that we get to be with people when they are at their most vulnerable and most scared. And that is just a tremendous privilege. I think most of this in internal medicine would probably give a, a similar answer to what George and Rachel had said, and, and that patient care and patient experience is our, our number one um, most rewarding element of our job. I think I'll add a second just to provide some additional context. I think what I find a lot of joy with is the team aspect of medicine and the education part of medicine. I think working at somewhere like UCLA, we have you know residents on our team, we have medical students, um, so we interact with them a lot in the attendings where you have group discussions, you kind of figure out how you can best help the patients. And I think that's really fun and very stimulating. And you do a lot of teaching, um, not only for those trainees, but also for your patients and for their families about what's going on with their bodies and how are we treating that and how are we going to keep them healthy and keep them out of the hospital. And I think you have lots of just really rich discussions um, with all of those people, all those people you're working with. And I think that keeps me very engaged and very fulfilled on a daily basis. I, yes, I agree with everything that has been said and, and share some of the, um, the similar um, thoughts about why this field is so incredible and obviously the challenges that come with it. Um, 
so I think the connection with patients in medicine is is probably the one of the most important things because to realize the impact that you've had on patients and their families. And it's again, something that I remind students and residents of when the days are long and things don't go as expected is realizing that impact that you've had on them, which um, in some cases is incredibly great. Um, there's also this like adrenaline rush when there's a diagnosis that you have to figure out and you're able to put all the pieces together um, to make a diagnosis. I was just on service, I'm still recovering, but um, they, uh, we had a patient who came in and she had just, um, she's, she's from Los Angeles area and she was in, um, in Asia over the, uh, for traveling and then basically got diagnosed with, um, diffuse large B cell, so lymphoma, um, in when, while she was over there and got on a plane, um, and came straight from LAX to UCLA emergency room and got admitted to the ER. She had a CAT scan of her chest that was completely normal um, on admission. And I was covering over the weekend and she just didn't look well to me. And her heart rate was up and she was breathing fast and her oxygen levels were down. Um, and I, I'm like, there's something going on with her. Let's just repeat the CT. And people looked at me and they were like, you really want to get another CT? And I said, yes, because something had happened to her and within the span of those 72 hours. And it was drastically different. She had blood clots in her lungs and she had fluid in her lungs that was quite significant, um, so significant that it caused um, collapse of the lung on both sides, um, which explained completely her the state that she was in. Um, and so it, it was like, you know, so at that moment, I'm like, I'm so happy I trusted my judgment to get the CT. Um, and it, it's again, like it's affirming and positive reinforcement that you have the knowledge and skills and um, and the judgment to, to care for these patients. Um, and we actually got her feeling better right away because we took some of that fluid off and her lungs were able to expand. And, and that was incredibly rewarding. Um, patients and their families sometimes see us as these um, individuals that have all the answers um, and, and also have the treatments at their armamentarium. And we provide a sense of hope um, that um, sometimes I think is very hard for us to deal with when we know that there's no more hope to give because we're, we've are we utilized all the yeah. treatments and the management that we have that's available um, to us. And there's really no more um, that we're able to give. And for me, it's this part that I still struggle with. Um, I started internship at UCLA 20 years ago. And, um, and even until this day, I still struggle with that piece of not being able to help someone, but have come to realize that the biggest piece that I need to do at that moment is to make sure that they're not suffering and they're comfortable. And we've done everything that we can to, to give them that comfort um, and also um, their families as well. So I would still say it's still a challenging piece for me, but I'm trying to, you know, I have a different mindset in terms of how I approach it. Um, but still difficult. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's amazing and like humbling too, that after 20 years, you're still conveying that this is a difficult thing to be able to, to tell patients that, you know, maybe there's not as much more that we can do for you, the limits of medicine and, and trying to stay hopeful, even though sometimes there's not more that can be done. Yeah. I guess, you know, we're, we're wrapping up on this conversation, but I, I'd like to, to end with kind of one question and you know, it's a broader question, but feel free to approach it any way you feel fit is if you could go back in time and talk to your college self, your medical self, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give about how to be successful in, in as a medical student and as a physician? It doesn't have to be on every single detail, but any, any glimmer or, or thing of wisdom that you really wish that or you found benefit that you could tell your, your younger self that you think might've been useful for you to know? I've actually reflected on this quite a bit. One of the things that I would definitely tell myself is um, to give myself some grace in terms of feeling the time pressure of like having to finish college in X number of years, going straight to med school, going to residency, um, knowing that life oftentimes will take you on a journey that can be unexpected. Um, and that it's it's okay to take a less traditional route.
for me, um, I think the hardest part is, and I think a lot of people that go into medicine have this trait of, of perfection. Um, and I've gotten told by several of my mentors, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And re realizing that my good is, is good. <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, I have this, um, intensity sometimes to, for example, I was giving a presentation on Tuesday night and to read more, to learn more. And I had to put it together so quickly because I didn't have that much time off service. And I'm like, I'm going to have to settle with this being, you know, my, my, it good, you know, and, and, and the feedback that I got afterwards was so incredibly positive that I'm like, yeah, it's okay to like, you know, do that and don't let, um, the perfectionism about, you know, that, that need to know everything, for example, or, um, the need to, um, you know, with, with my documentation, I mean, all of it, I think, you know, comes into play here is that the, the care, having confidence that the care that I provide, um, is translatable and that's the most important piece. Um, and that is good, um, and, and being okay with that. Yeah, I, I resonate with both of those um, points already shared, but I, I think the one other one I'll add is I remember feeling a lot of pressure to, I guess, being just surrounded by other pre-medical people and the expectations of what you're supposed to have done, what you're supposed to have in your CV or you're supposed to do to be get into medical school and be a good physician. And now having, I guess that was a lot, eight years ago, now, having gone this far, I've seen so many people come through with so many different skill sets and backgrounds, experiences who all make wonderful doctors. And you shouldn't necessarily feel pressured to do something that doesn't seem to be aligned with your interests or goals. I would say follow what you're actually passionate about. And all those things will translate through in your interview and your application. And um, there are so many different routes to being a successful and happy clinician. Absolutely. I think that is very much some of the same advice. I mean, everything that's been been said, there are common themes here, but I think the, the reminder that there are so many different ways to become an excellent physician and to not be afraid to take a less traditional path. I took a little bit less traditional of a path in terms of taking a couple of years before medical school. And then even within medical school, I took a very different kind of research fellowship year, different kind of research I had ever done before between third and fourth year. And I think at both of those junctures, just feeling like, oh, everyone else is doing this traditional way of um, approaching this journey. And at the end of the day, doing things that in a way that's better aligned with your interests, or if you register that you need some time to register and process what's been going on and you don't have the energy to keep going straight through, um, having that confidence and wisdom, I wish I could have told myself to not be so worried about it. Because now I look back and I think, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have done it any different way. Um, and so that, and then Dr. Alfaro's piece, I think is so well taken. Perfect is absolutely the enemy of good. How hard it is to live that in practice. And I think at each new juncture in our life or new transition to a new set of tasks, you know, George and Patrick and I are chief residents um, in internal medicine. We just started a couple of weeks ago, and I think we're going through our own, not if it's fair to speak for, for you guys, I think our own version of that now. You know, we maybe got to a better place of balance in residency, and now we're having to revisit some of that expectation setting and skill learning in this new role. That's so true. I think uh, one thing I've always been told is that in medicine, we're, we're lifelong learners. So whether yes. that be the knowledge or, or how to, to manage it, it's just a lifelong process. Yes. Um, so I don't know if the recording is going to cut out at seven, but I just want to say, you know, I personally gained a lot from this conversation with all of you. And I'm sure that our audience do and everyone else that watches it will as well. I really appreciate all of you taking the time out of your schedules to, to speak and, and impart your experiences and wisdom for all of us. So with that, let me go ahead and stop the recording.